Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about defensive driving. Smarter defensive driving. Significantly reducing your chances of being involved in a crash. Significantly reducing your chances of having an altercation or an incident on the roadway. Striking a fixed object. Striking a vulnerable road user. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. And we're also going to answer SB's question about what is defensive driving and how can you use it as a tool? What are the tools of defensive driving? What is the problem you're up against in terms of driving? And I call it social driving. Other drivers on the roadway are reactionary and retaliatory mostly because they follow too close and they don't give themselves enough time to drive their vehicle, to observe, and to react to other vehicles because they're too close. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. That's what we're going to help you with so that you can be a safer, smarter driver. My friend Mallory is here from the Maritimes. Hello, hello. SB, what is defensive driving? What is it all about? And is it highway or avoiding accidents and careless drivers? It's about avoiding crashes, okay? And I am reluctant to use the word accident because most crashes have a reason for happening they can be explained and we can give you feedback on what happened and give you an analysis of what happened and then we can use that information to so that you don't do it again in the future evan is here my friend joe is here from toronto uh <laughs> It's hot in Ontario, whereas it's raining here where I live. Uh, boy is here from Hawaii. Xander, hello. If you're just tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know what class of license you're going for, what questions we can answer. And it, all of this, the feedback, the questions that you ask, all make this easier, all, or all make this better because <laughs> we can help you out, and that's what we're trying to do. And with questions and with feedback, the explanations get better because you know when you're at a very high level in a subject sometimes you're not thinking about what other people are thinking uh in terms of those that are just learning or those that are just entering driving and getting a driver's license so all of that helps us out sean is here from minnesota uh melon melon on uh hello from toronto melissa is from windsor rod c do you know anything about the covington georgia drive test i have mine tomorrow pray for me uh covington georgia most of the driving tests in the state of Georgia have gone back to being on-road driver's tests. Uh, I don't know about Covington. There are a few places that still that have closed circuit testing, but not very many. So you would need to kind of figure that out from a local driving instructor. That's usually the best way to get the information. Um, okay, Evan, stop. Stop with the not signaling, because that's not true. If you're moving around a cyclist and you're on a driver's test, you have to signal, because you're going to move out of your lane if there isn't a bicycle lane. You're spreading false information, okay? Every time you change directions of the vehicle, every time you change lanes, you have to signal. And if you don't signal, eventually you're going to get into trouble. If you are trying to look for exceptions for not signaling, please don't drive. Okay, because you're unsafe. You're not communicating effectively with other people. So please stop doing that uh, and saying that you don't have to do certain things when you're driving. Okay, stop doing it. Uh, Julio is Fort Worth. Hello, uh, Roller Girl. Hello from Las Vegas. Uh, my friend Tim from Drive Smart BC is tuning in from Nanus Bay in, on Vancouver Island. Uh, endorsement needed soon. Oh, awesome. So th is this something, Tim, that they're implementing in the province of British Columbia? Tim, uh, Drive Smart BC, if you're in the province of British Columbia, check out Tim's channel. Uh, excellent information about traffic safety, road building, engineering, courts, case decisions affecting traffic, uh, traffic safety with motor vehicles and those types of things. Excellent forum over there as well if you're dealing with authorities, uh, dealing, want to have questions and participate in that question and answer. Uh, check out Drive Smart BC. Uh, Mallory, on Saturday morning, we had thunder, lightning, and heavy rain here in southwest Nova Scotia. Yeah, there seems to be quite a number of thunderstorms and bad weather this time of year as well. <laughs> here in British Columbia, we're having a very weird summer compared to what we had last year. Uh, this time last year, most of the province was on fire. This year, we're <laughs> getting a lot of rain, which is good because it postpones the... Uh, 
postpones fire season for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> now Tim is saying he'll be there within a year as a senior citizen. Uh, Melissa got my G2 road test book for the 11th. Going to have the refresher lesson right before the Delta driving. Awesome. And Melanie, can I ask you what you have your PhD in? Seems interesting. Uh, Melon, on uh, my PhD is in legal history, which is a study of policing, courts, and prisons. My expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. So looking at how policing changed because of traffic, how courts and laws change because of policing. So that's what I looked at. So I'm going to talk about defensive driving and... Uh, we get over here to the PowerPoint presentation. So what we do is we do the PowerPoint presentation. We spend about 10 minutes doing the presentation. Then we come back and we answer any questions you have about passing a driver's test, being a safer, smarter driver, or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. We can help you with all of that. Tyler, wait till winter. It will be summer. Just watch. Uh, I don't really understand that question, Tyler. Uh, Francis, hello from Saskatchewan. Great channel. Thank you so much, Francis. I uh, appreciate you being here and being part of the Smarter Driver community. Awesome, awesome. Just get over here to the presentation. There we go. Okay, so Smarter Defensive Driving and Smarter Defensive Driving. The This is a model of defensive driving that I have created. I have found it. I've been working on it here for some months. Uh, I would like to thank one of my clients who is one of the bigger trucking companies in the United States. Uh, they have been helping me work on this and with questions and feedback. Uh, this has finally come to the fruition. <laughs> so I have been working on it for probably a couple of years now. Minimum safe distance. This is the foundational component of the smarter defensive driving. Scope three is what I call it. It's essentially social driving, speed management, space management, observation and communication, but space maintaining minimum safe distance between your vehicle and other vehicles on the roadway and other road users is the fundamental component of this defensive driving model. For those of you who are new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s. Drove for Greyhound on one of the regional bus lines in Australia while I was going to university there. Uh, became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1998. Most of my work as a driving instructor was with big trucks, buses, and air brakes. I wrote a book called Air Brake Explained Simply. It's over at the Smart Drive Test website. Uh, and just on that note of the website, if you do go over there and can't find your way around or stuff isn't working, please send us an email. We're going through a major upgrade on the website right now. So there's a lot of changes going on. Uh, and in 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne with my degree in legal history, as I mentioned earlier, is the study of policing, courts, and prisons. And my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. Uh, if you want to know more about me, you can check out the autobiography over at the Smart Drive Test website. And I started the online business in 2015, the YouTube channel and the online business, and it's been way more successful than I could have imagined. And uh, very shortly here, within the next few weeks, we're going to surpass 250,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel. And we're approaching 25,000 followers on TikTok. So that's the other thing that we've been working on as well. Uh, last week, I had a request from Gumta to do a video on backing in on the blind side. So I did that video both in between other cars because I advocate using a landmark when you park. Uh, when you reverse stall park or perpendicular park. It's easier if you have another vehicle that's already in the space as opposed to trying to back into an empty space where you don't have any landmarks. So if you can do that, that's going to be a lot easier. Fundamental conflict. What is the fundamental conflict of traffic? Because anything that you do has a fundamental conflict. For example, if you have, if you go to work as a worker and you have an employer, the employer wants to pay you as little money as possible to get the most amount of work for, from you. And you, on the other hand, want to work as little as possible and get paid as much as possible. That's the fundamental conflict of worker-employer relationship. So in traffic, we have a fundamental conflict as well. And we need to keep this in mind when we're thinking about defensive driving. On the one hand, we have collisions, crashes that result because you put people in moving vehicles and they're going to bang into each other and crash into each other and they're going to have, drive off the road and those kinds of things. So that's the one hand. So we have crashes. And how many crashes, according to authorities, 
is acceptable per 100,000 population. In Africa, which is the worst country in the world for traffic crashes, you have approximately 25 deaths per 100,000 population. In Europe, which is the has the highest the, or the greatest traffic safety record in the world, it's about 10 deaths per 100,000 people. Okay, so those are acceptable numbers, somewhere between 10 and 25 per 100,000 people. On the other hand, you have congestion. How fast can people drive? How much congestion are we going to have in our cities because we put in safety features to control collisions? We have traffic lights and conventional intersections and we have laws and stop signs and yield signs and all of those things that are contributing to congestion because people can't drive as fast as they want because we have posted speed limits. So on the other hand, we have congestion <laughs> because on one hand, people want to drive as fast and quickly as possible, but on the other hand, we have traffic crashes. What is the acceptable number of traffic crashes? What is the highest speed limit that people can drive? So there's your basic conflict in traffic. The next thing that you're dealing with is social driving. This is what you're dealing with when you go out on the roadway and you're learning how to drive and you want to get your driver's license. You're going to very quickly realize that it's about me first. Me first, okay? And if you don't, if you get in my way or you violate some rule that I think is imperative in driving, that I'm gonna honk at you, I'm gonna flip you the bird, I'm gonna follow too close behind you because you are in my way and I'm gonna let you know that you did something wrong. Social driving, most people follow too close. Therefore, they are reactionary. They're hoping on a wing and a prayer that when they follow three feet behind the person in front of them, that if the person in front of them slams on the brakes, that they can get their vehicle stopped in time. And most of the time they can't because there's a lot of tailgate crashes. Okay, and it's retaliatory. If you do something wrong, if you don't go and the other person thinks that there, there is sufficient gap, they're gonna honk, they're gonna flip the bird, <laughs> and they're gonna flash their lights. They're gonna tell you that you did something wrong. So some of the hallmarks of social driving, keeping up with traffic flow, which is above the posted speed limit, rolling through stop signs, failing to signal, honking, driving over painted islands, following too close, crowding pedestrians, failing to yield. We could go on and on and on and on about social driving. So, to keep yourself safe, speed is comprised of two things. Speed is made up of time and distance, okay? We are traveling a certain distance over a period of time, miles per hour. We are traveling 60 miles in one hour. And what we need to do is we need to control space around our vehicle, and we can always control space in front of our vehicle so that we have more time. Because if you have time, you have options, and options prevent crashes. With time, you can observe traffic patterns. With time, you can predict and track other road users. With time, you can communicate effectively, put your signals on, move your vehicle, those types of things. With time, you can work the controls of your vehicle. And with time, you can read and respond to other traffic, thus making you more predictable and proactive on the roadway. So... The fundamental component of the smarter driver, the smarter defensive driving is to control space in your in front of your vehicle. And scope three, speed management, space management, social driving, communication and observation, and being predictable and proactive on the roadway. So these are the five components. Social driving, space management, speed management, communication and observation. Smarter defensive driving is based on two things. There are only two things that you need to change in your driving. You need to have a three to four second following distance at all times, and you should stop in traffic so that you can see the tires in the, in, of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement. If you can do those two things, if you can change those two things about your driving, because nothing in social driving, nothing in the arena of driving every day does this. But if you can do this, I promise you, you will be a safer, smarter driver. And I know some of you are gonna say, oh, that's crazy, you can't do that because you know, you're know you gonna contribute to congestion. Actually, and thank you, Joe, for sending all of that information about uh, space management, this actually reduces congestion if you can control space in front of your vehicle. Reasons for stopping in traffic so you can see the tires making clear contact with the pavement. It 
is a defensive posturing against being rear-ended because if you're sitting there and you see the car coming up too fast behind you, you can actually pull ahead or pull out around the vehicle in front of you. If the vehicle in front breaks down, you can move out and around it. If you change your mind and you want to go somewhere else, you can get out from behind that vehicle without waiting for that vehicle to move forward. Uh, if the vehicle in front of you, as many of you in Europe or other places in the world, are driving manual transmissions and they roll backwards, they're not going to roll off. They're not going to roll into you because you're two feet off the bumper of the vehicle in front of you. And then finally, as I said, in the world of congestion, all of the vehicles could move off together if they kept that space minimum safe distance you can always manage the space in front of your vehicle and you should be using the accelerator control space between you and other vehicles on the roadway the only time that you should be using the brake is when you're stopping controlling speed on a downhill slowing to turn or unexpected events if you are using the brake for anything other than that you're using you're overusing the brake and you're being reactionary and following too close so if you have these three things four things in place and that's the only time that you're using the brake you are doing really well in terms of being a smarter safer driver this was one of the videos on TikTok that went crazy. I uh, got 800,000, more than 800,000 views. I was talking about driving between the clusters on the highway for whatever reason. You see cars going down the roadway and they insist on driving at the same speed in groups. <laughs> Stay out of the clusters on the roadway. Always have that minimum safe distance between you, between other road users and between fixed objects. If you can maintain and protect that space between you and other vehicles, other road users, again, that is what is going to safeguard you against and significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. Proactive and predictable. This is what you want to move from being reactionary and retaliatory. So you're close enough, you're far enough away that now you can have decisions because you've controlled distance and so now you have time to make decisions about what's going on in the traffic environment because as we know traffic is dynamic it's always changing the vehicles in and around your vehicle where you are are always different and because they're always different traffic is always different and what's going to happen with the traffic patterns is always different you have time to communicate you have time to read and respond to the traffic in which you're driving reading and responding looking ahead at controlled intersections looking at turning lanes looking for rubberneckers and situations out of the ordinary if there's a police officer on the other side of the road and they have a vehicle pulled over i can almost guarantee you that traffic is going to slow down because people are having a look why did that person get pulled over what did that person do are they an evil person do they all tatted up and got piercings and are riding a Harley Davidson and you know they're part of the Hell's Angel and they're you know there's six police officers pulling them over and slamming them down on the hood and those kinds of things we want to see that kind of stuff right so we're looking for that kind of stuff and tra it's going to affect traffic patterns so know that knowing characteristics of vehicles and road users speed differentials and we could get into a great deal of um detail about speed differentials know that different road users on the roadway travel at different speeds and probably the most the the most significant example that i can come up with is the difference between your vehicle and a pedestrian pedestrians are walking at five or six miles an hour you're driving at 30 or 40 miles an hour in the city there's a big speed differential of 25 to 30 miles an hour between your vehicle and the pedestrian if you don't maintain space from that pedestrian you're you're not going to have time to react to respond accordingly and you're going to end up reacting so you want to maintain space from other road users and know the characteristics of other road users and know how uh, fast they're traveling also the time of year motorcycles in the spring in the summertime it's going to be rvs and camper trailers even despite the price of fuel we still have trucks and boats going up and down the road trucks and camper trailers and big rvs going up and down the road so know that these units in the summertime have different characteristics in the winter time depending on which part of the world you are if you're in northern minnesota you're in washington state in the snow Squalamy pass northern california oregon places like that all of these places are going to have snowmobiles 
So seasons play a key role in being in predictable traffic patterns. And then finally, intersections. 40% of crashes happen at intersections. Map intersections and track intersections as you're approaching. And every one of these signs on this slide is a warning sign that there you are approaching an intersection. Pay attention to the traffic signs. Where are the intersections? Mapping and tracking road users as you're approaching the intersection. And the key word there, mapping. Where are they? Are they going to intersect with my path of travel? In other words, are they going to cross my path of travel? If they are, you need to respond accordingly. Take your foot off the, the throttle, slow down, come to a stop, and let the pedestrian get across the roadway because there are certain areas of every large town, our place here, we have a lot of transients in a certain area of town, and they just walk across the road thinking that traffic is going to stop for them. So know that when you're approaching the intersections. Good luck in your driver's tests, and remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. We'll get back over here and answer questions. Uh, Tim said, I would be interested in hearing your take on managing speed with an automatic transmission. In other words, don't just stick it in D for dumb and driving that way all the time. Uh, it's the same thing, Tim. There's really not a lot of difference between an automatic transmission and a manual transmission. Uh, you're not really shifting through the gears in a manual transmission to control speed. Automatic transmission, you can just work that throttle and control space between you and vehicles in front. So long as you're maintaining that three to four second following distance, and we talk about that all the time, that the vehicle in front passes a stationary object and as soon as they pass, we start counting one watermelon, two watermelons, three watermelons, and when we go past the same fixed object, that's our following distance. Nobody does that, okay? So what you can do instead is just monitor your brake use. If you're using the brake for anything other than slowing down to stop, slowing down to turn, or controlling your speed on a downgrade, you're using the brake too much because, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but most of the time you should be controlling your space behind other traffic with just using the throttle. And if you can do that, there's a lot of other benefits that come along with buying time, which buys you options and allows you to read and respond to traffic. There's, you know, increased fuel economy. There's uh, increased, decreased maintenance costs on your vehicle because you're not on the brakes all the time trying to respond and react fast enough to other traffic. Marizone, thank you so much for the super chat. That is awesome, my friend. I always drive in the, uh, uh, in the right speed, but many times some drivers follow too close to me. What can I do in that situation? I'm a new driver. Excellent. And yes, other drivers are going to tailgate you. And again, this minimum safe distance in front of your vehicle is going to make up for the person behind you that is tailgating you. So two or three strategies that you can do when people are tailgating you. First of all, increase the distance in front of your vehicle because now you're driving your vehicle and you're driving the vehicle behind you because you don't want to have aggressive braking or aggressive throttling or steering or those types of things so that you hope that the person on a wing and a prayer gets stopped behind you. So the next thing you can do is if you're not driving in the right lane, move over to the right lane and then let them go past. If there's a place to pull off, for example, my uh, Tracy lives up at the ski hill here. It's a single lane, two lane road up to the ski hill. There's lots of pullouts where you can pull off and let the person go past you. So there's a couple, two, three things there you can do to prevent other people from tailgating you when you're driving. Uh, Mallory, don't turn left onto the street with someone in the crosswalk of the street that you're turning into. And that is exactly correct. Uh, Mallory and what Mallory is talking about again if you're sitting at an intersection and you're preparing to turn left where you're looking is you're looking over on that far corner and looking for pedestrians coming across on the cross street and that's part of your mapping and tracking intersections you're tracking that road user you are going in that direction and that road user that pedestrian is going to cross your path of travel they're going to cross where you're going the two of you are going to intersect Thus, it's an intersection. You have to give way. And we want minimum 
three feet or one meter of space between our vehicle and pedestrians. And when we're turning, we if the if the pedestrian is going away from us, we need half a lane of space, minimum safe distance. And if the pedestrian is coming towards us, it's at least one and a half lanes of minimum safe distance between your vehicle and the pedestrian. Excellent. Uh, Tim, I'm a Neanderthal then as I use my transmission to control speed, both auto and manual, sometimes backing off the throttle is not enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tim, it's exactly what I said in my video on downshifting a manual transmission. I don't downshift anymore. Uh, that thinking in terms of controlling speed with the transmission is left over from the 1940s and the 1950s when brakes were unreliable on cars and you had to use the transmission to bring the vehicle and slow the vehicle down. My question when people tell me that they use the transmission to slow down their vehicle is, why would you use a $15,000 drivetrain to save $500 brakes? I mean, you know, some vehicles are $1,000 to change the brakes, but $500 to $1,000. Why would you use a, a drivetrain? The rear end, the transmission, the, the clutch, the, you know, the engine, all of those things. I mean, and don't get me wrong, on a downgrade, on a long downgrade, that's different, okay? I'm just talking about normal everyday driving uh, using the transmission to slow the vehicle down. And that's the question I pose to people. Why would you use a fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 drivetrain to save $500,000 brakes, okay? Uh, Joe, about clusters, don't be a sheep, don't be a follower, a zombie, be an independent driver. Hey, it's July 4th, and yes, it is. Happy 4th of July to all of our friends south of the border. Hope you're having a great time. Uh, there in the States. Uh, Tyler, my car, it's off by five kilometers an hour, so I do 55, which is 50 for me since the car is old. And yes, some of the older vehicles will have speedometers that are off a tiny bit. Uh, the speedometer in the buggy is off about three kilometers an hour, so I go a little bit faster just to do that. Uh, Nelson, Trans says two second following distance uh, as the DDDC instructor. I like the three second following distance. Anybody too close will be caught with surprise. Uh, the South Trail Driving School. Nelson and I did a video and Corey will put that up for you on driving uh, drivers with disabilities and uh, controls that they can put on their vehicle. Now, Nelson, I believe that you sent me an email and it somewhere got stuck down at the bottom of the pile. Could you send me that email again? Uh, because if anybody sends me an email and I don't get back to you, it's not because I'm ignoring you or I... You, you know, thinking that I don't like you, it's be just because I get hundreds of emails every day and sometimes I just don't get back. So if, if I don't get back to you right away, just send me another one and just <laughs> say, hey, you, you missed my email here. So that's great. Thanks so much, Nelson, for that. Uh, Mallory, just wondering what you should do when you're stuck behind a piece of farm equipment is going slow on a country road. Uh, yes, and Mallory, we have another video on that, uh, slow moving vehicles, slow moving vehicle signs. Sometimes you're just gonna get stuck behind a piece of farm equipment. It happens. And you're not gonna be able to get out and pass because most of the time when you're stuck behind farm equipment, especially if you're in rural Ontario where my folks live, that's just part and parcel of driving. And this is, you know, I was talking about uh, seasonal driving with snowmobiles and cars and motorcycles and those types of things. You also have locational driving as well. You know, I live in a small town. Uh, if you're living in Vancouver, it's going to be very different driving. Uh, you know, like li living in Toronto, for example, it's going to be different driving. But if you're living in rural Nova Scotia or you're living in Huron County in Ontario, where my folks live, you're going to be dealing with farm equipment going up and down the road. And you're just going to have to be patient until it is safe to pass. And when I met my folks this year, uh, I'm going there in August. I'll do some videos on passing farm equipment and redo those older videos because those old videos need to be redone. It was a long time ago when I did them, so we'll redo those for you for sure. Uh, Fritz, what is the minimum speed in taking road tests? Uh, Fritz from Minnesota, uh, thank you more. Rick, God bless. Um, the minimum speed, so it's either the posted speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less. So if you have clear roads and there's not a lot of traffic, then go the posted speed limit. If the traffic flow, other traffic is traveling less than the posted speed limit, then go whatever the traffic flow is going. All right, that's what you need to drive for the purposes of your driving test. 
Uh, Mallory was walking in downtown Charlottetown doing some work with my king and somebody turned left on the street that was crossing on the crosswalk. And this is the other thing. We, we, uh, traffic deaths amongst vulnerable road users has gone off the charts in the United States of America. <laughs> They've had the highest number of deaths, traffic deaths among vulnerable road users in decades. And they say, you know, what what we're doing, I mean, one of the one of the things that we're doing, traffic safety authorities, and you can see this with school speed zone signs. They're trying to reduce the speed differential between cars and pedestrians so that you have more time to react to other road users. The piece that I don't see in terms of traffic safety campaigns is saying the pedestrian needs to look and needs to look again and needs to listen. <laughs> Never underestimate when you are walking, when you are riding your bicycle, because I've been back on my bicycle uh, the last little bit, how important sound is. Sound is so important. And when you're stepping out onto the roadway, uh, you know, you're, you're looking there, you're looking to the left because you're looking for those right turning vehicles. You're also looking over there for the left turning vehicles so that you're not stepping out in front of a car. So traffic safety needs not just to focus on the driver, traffic safety also needs to focus on the pedestrian and the vulnerable road users, the, the cyclists, the, the kids on scooters, the electric scooters that are now taking you know everywhere on our roadways and pedestrian. And any you know parents that have small children, you're always looking around for cars and you know teaching them about uh, road sense. Where are the cars? Where are they coming from? You know, and it's same thing when I take my kids to school looking, you know, my kids go and cross the major road. I said, you know, look over there, look for that right turning vehicle, make sure that that vehicle is stopping uh, because that's your closest adversary. Is that trap is that car right there when you're walking? So thank you for that, Mallory. And I know it's a little tougher for you, Mallory, but certainly sound. We underestimate how important sound is in driving and in walking and in riding your bicycle riding a motorcycle, shoulder checking, looking, 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 right? Because shoulder check is not just for drivers. You're going to shoulder check when you're walking too to make sure that that car is not going to turn right into you when you're uh, stepping out into the roadway. Uh, Prague? No, it's not. Uh, Roller Girl, I rode my bike for years in Vegas. I pretended that everyone is drunk because they may be, and I completely agree with you, Roller Girl. Uh, I have had quite a number of incidents on my bicycle. Not a number of incidents, but over the years, I, I've been run over, run into, and I've been doored on my bicycle. I've had a few crashes, yes. And I touch wood, I'm still here. <laughs> uh, Sakina, uh, which steering is more effective in an emergency situation, hand over hand over ha or hand to hand? Uh, in an emergency situation, hand over hand is much better. You just you can just manipulate the steering wheel so much faster than hand to hand. Hand to hand, uh, I you know, I I don't know where it came from, but it's it's ineffective in manipulating the steering wheel. Uh, Marizone uh, here in Toronto during the celebrations of Canada Day, too many impaired drivers and crashes, and it's unfortunate. And Tim can talk to this as well if you go out and check his, out his channel. The grassroots movements, the uh, social media campaigns to end drink driving unfortunately have not been effective and we still have the problem of drink driving in our society and this is one of the reasons that we have especially here in the province of british columbia increased police powers to try and deal with this issue that we still have uh, in our society so know that that you know if you go out on a friday afternoon a friday evening or you're driving on the weekends that there is a much higher probability that a lot of the drivers on the roadway are going to be drunk and unfortunately it's not something it's not something i think that we are going to eradicate anytime soon it's the same thing uh with distracted driving people are distracted we have so many things uh now in motor vehicles that distract us it's not just phones 
It's the telematics. It's that big screen in the middle of the new car that we have. It's the stereo. It's the cruise control. It's the windshield wipers. It's all kinds of things. Eating, drinking, uh, passengers, music, podcasts. Uh, there are so many things that are going to distract us. Now, there is a book here I have somewhere uh, which looks at drink driving as a phenomena, as a social social phenomena in the United States of America, and it looks as driving and it puts the two things together, and he actually proposes the radical idea that we're not fixing, we're not stopping or eliminating drink driving. Why don't we teach these people how to drive drunk? It's a crazy idea and it probably would never fly, but it's another option that we have out there to, to do and to put forth, but it's not something that would ever be accepted by the driving public, that we teach people how to drive drunk. But it's there. Uh, <laughs> Tim says you are an impaired driver long before you were drunk and I agree with what Tim is saying we were talking about this last week one of one of my mates uh, was he has uh, two or three bars uh, you know in establishments and it very much depends you know we have an art you know the 0 0.05 or the 0 0.08 or whatever the legal limit is for blood alcohol that is a completely arbitrary number that's a number that the authorities, decided was probably the best number that they could come up with you know me personally uh you know i could have one drink an hour and i wouldn't be drunk now if i didn't eat all day and i went and worked out rode my bicycle was out in the hot sun and then had one pint of beer there's no way that i would drive because i know for a fact that i would be completely inebriated i wouldn't be legally drunk but i would be inebriated because of the my own, you know, my physical reaction to alcohol. And it's going to depend on our mood. It's going to depend on what we've been doing all day and those types of things on whether we're drunk or not. So exactly what Tim said there. Uh, <laughs> okay, Mallory, thanks for that. Uh, Joe, predictability amazes me whenever there's all kinds of craziness happening all around me. And I stay in the same lane at a dead constant speed. The calmness seems to spread to many nearby drivers. And Joe, it's you're absolutely right that other people stop being crazy uh, when you hold your line and you stay predictable on the roadways. That other people will stop changing lanes and all kinds of things. It's the broken window theory that Giuliani had years ago uh, when he cleaned up New York, right? If you have a broken window and it's, it's smashed then and you leave it other people are going to come along and they're going to smash the rest of the windows however if you go and take that broken window and you fix that broken window then it's going to deter other people from breaking the other windows it's the same thing uh you know i read this story years ago about a janitor who was complaining about people throwing cigarette butts into the urinals in the men's washroom and this of course this was back when we when everybody in society smoked right and uh, the other janitor said to him, he said, just keep the cigarette butts cleaned out of the toilet uh, for a couple of days, two, three days. And within a week of the janitor cleaning and keeping the cigarette butts cleaned out of the urinals, nobody was throwing cigarette butts into the urinals after that. Because we have this form of communication within our society that is kind of unconscious or unwritten. It's kind of like other people aren't doing it, then I shouldn't do it either. So the windows aren't broken, they're not smashed, so I'm not going to smash the windows. I'm not going to throw my cigarette butts. If I drive in a decent, predictable, proactive fashion, it's going to have a ripple effect on other traffic in and around you. Uh, Drive Smart BC. Uh, BC bought in on the IRP because of it was becoming too difficult to deal with impaired driving criminally, and that's exactly right. That's exactly what I believe Tim uh, was that exactly what you said. It was far too difficult to prosecute and convict uh, drink driving in the courts. And it was just taking way too many resources. Uh, 0297, I live in Houston and I drive for a delivery company every day. And the stuff I see drivers do is insane. All of reckless, careless drivers and not driving defensively. I always shoulder check. And that is great to hear, 0297. Yeah, the other things that other people are doing, and it was like Roller Girl said, you know, never trust other drivers. Always assume 
that they're doing something goofy in their vehicle. They're not paying attention. They're looking at their phone. They're not shoulder checking. All kinds of things that people are doing in the arena of social driving. They all do it. And it's the same thing, you know, I've been talking a little bit about vehicle technology, blind spot detectors, backup cameras, and those types of things. And, you know, I love technology on cars. Don't get me wrong. Absolutely love technology on cars. I just don't trust it very much. Okay? And it's the same thing with other drivers. Love other drivers. Love driving. But I don't, you know, and I love other drivers, but I don't trust them very much. And that's one of the first principles of keeping yourself on the roadway, doing the right thing when you're driving. Uh, Marizone, is it okay to treat amber light as a red light when I stop? Uh, if you, if it's safe, Marizone, yes. Yellow and red lights for the purposes of a driver's test are one and the same. If it's a yellow light, it means if it's safe to do so, come to a stop. Prepare to stop. Unfortunately, within driving, many people think that yellow lights mean proceed with caution, and it very much does not mean, <laughs> it does not mean proceed with caution. It means come to a stop if it's safe to do so. If the person behind you isn't, you know, two feet off your bumper, then yes, come to a stop. Uh, Herbert, you failed your driver's test. Sorry to hear about that. Uh, you know, look at the feedback that the driving examiner gave you and, you know, just go and do it again. You will get it the next time. You're going to be great. Uh, Tim says, I feel goofed at hundred milligrams. <laughs> yeah. And you know, Tim, like I said, it for, and you know, it depends on your emotional state. It depends on your physiological state, how much have you had to eat and those types of things. Right. Uh, so, you know, whether you're going to be affected by alcohol and how much you're going to be affected by alcohol. Have a great dinner. All the best, my friend. Uh, Apnik says uh, technology is good. Corey's put up the video on yellow traffic lights. Thank you for that. Uh, Buify uh, on road tests. What is the speed limits on residential areas? Uh, Buify, remind me again, you're in Ontario, are you not? Uh, Joe, the broken window theory, cool. First time I heard of it, but it makes total sense uh, physiologic, uh, psychologically. Yes, it does, uh, Joe, and it actually, you know, it works. And, uh, you know, a group of people can have an effect on other people, and we can kind of lead people through actions that we take, right? And it's like I told you about the cigarette butts in the urinals, the broken windows theories, and that was very much what Giuliani believed when he cleaned up New York because New York City was a very dangerous place in the late 80s and early 90s and then Giuliani became the mayor and that was his theory. All right, uh, thank you Buify. So the speed limit is 50 kilometers an hour here in the province of British Columbia in the cities. It's 80 kilometers an hour out on the roadways. But one of the things you should be doing Buify and this goes for all of you taking a driver's test be sure that you practice in and around the test center where you're going to be taking your test and know what the speed limits are and where they change, okay? So if you get into a residential area, it's going to be 50 kilometers an hour, but if you get out onto some of the multi-lane roads, it could go 60 kilometers an hour, which is 40 miles an hour, or it could go uh, 35 miles an hour, or it could go up to 70 kilometers an hour, which is 40 uh, miles an hour. So know that and practice in and around. And the other piece about that is if your test is on a Thursday at 10 o'clock in the morning, make sure that you're practicing during the weekdays in and around the test center at that time at 10 o'clock in the morning so you know what to expect in terms of the volume of traffic that you're going to be dealing with when you take your driver's test. Know as well that driving examiners are not going to take you out on a road that is known for being jammed up. For example, Victoria, British Columbia, the Trans-Canada Highway uh, going west out of the city at four o'clock in the afternoon is <laughs> bumper to bumper every afternoon. It's just part of its, you know, rush hour traffic. Driving examiners are not going to take you out onto the Trans-Canada Highway and make you sit in traffic. They don't want to sit in traffic either. They want to do your test, they want to finish your test, and they want to go home at the end of the day on time. They don't want to be sitting around doing overtime. So know that they're not going to do that and make you sit in traffic for the purposes of your driver's test. Uh, Tim says, forensic science says that your ability to drive is impaired regardless of your driving experience, 100 milligrams. Uh, I don't know about that. It's, it's also about a tolerance to alcohol as well. 
and uh, it would be interesting to know the impact, you know, of marijuana, distracted driving, and driving drunk, and those different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, those substances that cause inebriation or distractions while you're driving. Uh, okay, Marizon, uh, can I have some advice to avoid aggressive drivers? Okay, so aggressive drivers. Uh, Marizon, one of the things that you're going to have to do, thank you so much for the super chat, is you're, you're, you know, one of the tough things as a new driver or a learning driver is that you're going to have to focus on what you're doing. It, regardless of whether you're in a driving school car, regardless of whether you have your L sticker on your car, your learner sticker, or you have your novice sticker on your car, other drivers are going to honk at you. They're impatient. And it comes back to what I was talking to you about with social driving. It's me first. And if you are in my way or you don't go when they think the gap is sufficient, they're going to honk. They're going to give you the finger. They're going to flash their lights. Uh, they might even get out of their vehicle. Now, if they do that, they get out of their vehicle, lock your doors, don't engage, don't look at them, don't take pictures of them with your phone because they can only stay angry for a couple of minutes. They can't stand there and, and yell at you for 20 minutes. They're going to get it off their chest. They're going to tell you what they think of you and say something bad about your mother. And then they're going to go and get back in their car and they're going to drive away most of the time. If they don't, simply drive to a police station or drive to a public area somewhere and wait for them to go away, okay, if it gets that bad. But, again, lock your doors. Don't roll down your windows. Don't open the doors for any reason. Don't make eye contact with them. And don't take pictures of them with your camera, okay? Simply don't engage. People who are angry with you and are participating in road rage just want to get it off their chest that they're angry and it will only last for a couple of minutes okay i've had a few road rage incidents i had one uh you know it was partly my own fault because the guy did tick me off i was riding my bicycle in australia uh come through an intersection it was kind of an offset intersection that went to the left and there was a tram and i was going in beside the tram and this guy went past me on his car he was close enough to me on my bicycle that I was able to go like this and hit the side of his car. And because I hit his car, he stops, he cuts me off. And of course I got up on the sidewalk, put my bicycle up against the post and I'm standing there and he's like yelling at me. He's like standing on the road and I'm standing up six inches on the curb and he's like, ah, I'm going to punch you. Ah, take you out. You hit my car. And I, <laughs> I'm kind of thinking in my head because I have a martial arts background. I'm thinking, you know, if you're going to hit me, you're not going to be very effective because you're down there. You need to be up here if you're going to hit me. And, uh, you know, he had his little yell at me for a couple of minutes and then he got back in his car and drove off, right? He just wanted to yell at me for hitting his car. But, you know, at one and the same time, I was like, you don't really need to be six inches away from me when you're going past me. That's not safe at all. Roller girl, uh, Evan, other than using blinkers and hand signals, a way to signal is positioning your vehicle. Yes, another way to communicate, Evan, is the position of your vehicle on the roadway communicates intent. If you're in the left turning lane, high probability that you're going to turn left. At least we hope so most of the time. Uh, Curtis, happy 4th of July. Happy Independence Day to you as well, my friend. Hope you're celebrating. Hope you're safe and having a great time. Uh, Joe said, uh, when you're 20 and alert and in good shape, a 0 0.05 alcohol level might be okay when you're older or you've just come off a 12-hour graveyard shift. You might be impaired at zero, and that is absolutely correct. And this is the other piece <coughs> that I wanted to elaborate on for new drivers. The other piece that we don't talk about with new drivers and we don't talk about with ourselves in terms of life, we don't talk about experience. Experience having experience driving so new drivers are facing the what i call the four d's driving dating distractions and drinking okay and you don't have any a whole lot of experience with any one of those things i mean maybe you have some experience with with dating you have a good example from your parents and you know puppy love and all kinds of things but that's new driving is new drinking is new distractions are new especially now that we live in this crazy world where we have a phone and we have a tablet and we have a computer and it's like 
coming at you all the time and you're like, oh, look over there. Oh, shiny stuff. Oh, squirrel, right? You're distracted all the time in society and it takes a lot of focus to just kind of do one thing. So that's the other thing about drinking is young people who are new to drinking because, you know, what? unless you're European or unless your parents have been letting you drink since you were 12 and, you know, monitoring and helping you kind of get some, you know, uh, you know, some idea of what it's like to drink, <laughs> then when you get to drinking, unfortunately, too many of us, I know that was my experience, that we just kind of binge drink, right? We don't know how much we can drink. Uh, you know, now I know exactly how much I can drink. I can have two or three beers and that that's enough for me. Whereas, you know, when I was younger, it was like, oh, that's, oh, that's too much. <laughs> and now I'm sick and I'm hung over because I had way too much alcohol. So that's the other thing that you need to kind of keep in mind when you're new to driving, that it's not just driving. You're new to driving. You're new to distractions. You're new to dating. You know, what is, what are your emotions doing, you know, with a significant other? Uh, and then dr drinking. What does the effect of wine have on you? What is the effect that spirits have on you? Drinking whiskey and or drinking beer and then drinking different kinds of beer because they all have different kinds of alcoholic content. So which so how do you separate those things out so you're not trying you're not thinking, "Oh, I can do distractions. I can text on my phone and drive." Can you? Probably not safely. So the challenge of focusing and saying to yourself, I can't do these two things at the same time. I can't drink and drive because I don't have experience with either one of these things and I'm probably gonna drink too much. So know that, that you don't have a great deal of experience with any one of those four Ds, drinking, driving, distractions, and dating, okay? <laughs> if you're younger than 20 years old, right? And then, of course, we could get into the whole craziness of, you know, our brains don't fully mature until we're 25, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. But I'm not going to enter into that. I'm just going to talk about the fact that you don't have a lot of experience with drinking. You don't have a lot of experience with dealing with distractions. I mean, my daughter had a cell phone temporarily when she traveled to her nans by herself and, you know, she does not she's she was 12 at the time she does not have the major, maturity to use a cell phone because they, they don't realize that what they put in text that's permanent okay and i will just say that to you if a grievance for somebody uh you need to think very seriously about what you put in text because when you put it in text you call somebody a bad name and you say something bad about their mother okay that's in writing <laughs> they can take a screenshot of that and you know, if it proceeds to legal proceedings, uh, they can use that in a court of law as evidence against you. So know that, okay? And so she didn't have a great deal of uh, experience with texting. And you know, it's part of maturity, right? And it's the same thing with you if you're drinking, if you're getting to drinking age and you can do that, that's, you know, think about that. Uh, Gupta, my friend, without using, uh, how are you doing? I'm good, I practiced parallel parking, was able to nail it one go. All thanks to you. My verse parking is also good. Uh, now parked in one, uh, both sides. Awesome. Congratulations. That's great that those skills are coming along. Uh, so happy to have my test on Wednesday. Fingers crossed. I promised my daughter ice cream after that. That is awesome, Gupta. <laughs> and we're looking forward to ice cream and looking forward to hearing that you're going to pass your driver's test. So fingers crossed. All the best. Remember to breathe and through your nose, into your belly button, into your navel. Hold for three and then release, and that'll cause your body to relax. Awesome, awesome. So just a quick reiteration, just going over the main points of smarter defensive driving. It's based on two driving techniques. And although they seem simple, they are not simple, and they will change your entire driving attitude, your driving expectations. Speed is made up of two components, time and distance. If you can control distance, you have more time. If you have more time, you have more options in your driving and options reduce traffic crashes. So three to six second following distance, depending on the size of your vehicle. And the way that you know that is, is that you're only using the brake to come to a stop, slow for turning or controlling your speed on a downgrade or unexpected events. Now, 
that's an ideal. You're not going to be able to do it all the time. Obviously, you want to reduce the amount of braking that you're using and controlling and having more space in front of your vehicle. And then the next thing is stopping so that you can see the tires of the vehicle in front, making clear contact with the pavement. If you can do those two things and you can have that minimum safe distance when you're driving, you are going to significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash because you now are reading and responding to traffic as opposed to being reactionary because when you're too close you're not driving your vehicle anymore you're hoping that you can react in time to the vehicle in front of you and we get distracted when we're driving we make mistakes it happens we're human beings we're not perfect and if you have that minimum safe distance between your vehicle and other vehicles it's going to compensate or make allowances for those errors in your driving <coughs> Excuse me. If you have that minimum safe distance, it's going to give you that safety zone where you can make mistakes, where you can get distracted. Because I don't care who you are, you are going to get distracted when you're driving. There's all kinds of things going on. The telematics, the stereo, the windshield wipers, uh, somebody walking down the street, somebody doing something goofy, something that you hadn't seen before <laughs> along the roadway. So you're all going, you're always, almost always going to get distracted at some point in your driving. Uh, Crystal, my driving practice went well yesterday. I need now to get my learner's permit so I can uh, drive in the car with my parents in real driving situations. Awesome, and you can do that. And, and uh, Corey will put up the playlist for the learner's license for how to practice for that. Uh, Mallory, I don't agree with drinking and driving or texting and driving. Both of those are bad ideas, and they are, uh, Mallory, no doubt. And so this is one of the reasons why you need to practice minimum safe distance around your vehicle because, unfortunately, there are people on the roadway who are driving who are doing both of those things. We cannot eliminate that. Uh, Epic, I find your method of stopping behind the crosswalk line more useful than a advancing into the intersection since you can reduce the risk of left turns uh, being rear-ended or T-bone accidents. Uh, yeah, epic. And uh, that video did really well. I've got a lot of feedback uh, on that. And I've, with no uncertain terms, been told by a lot of people that there's no way you would ever get through an intersection in New York City or Newark, Los Angeles, or any other big city in the United States of America. I can say with certainty that I have driven in every every major city in the United States of America. I have driven in Europe, I've driven in Australia, and you can put your front steer tires in the front crosswalk line. You're committed to the turn, but you're not in the intersection, and you are not causing congestion. You are not going to get any more vehicles through the intersection, because if there is congestion and a lot of traffic, boom, as soon as that light goes yellow, you start driving straight into the intersection, double triple check that the oncoming traffic is coming to a stop and boom you go around and you make your turn and you're actually moving through the intersection faster because you don't have your wheels turned and trying to get the vehicles going from a dead stop when you're sitting in the middle of the intersection and you're now back you get some speed built up boom traffic stopped i've checked a double check boom and you just go around the corner and you're in the intersection for like a second and you've also reduced your chances of being struck by oncoming traffic because you have reduced the amount of time that you're in the crosshairs of the oncoming traffic. And yeah, so that's been a big <laughs> big video and a lot of feedback uh, over there on TikTok. So if uh, any of you want some more information or want to uh, participate in the conversation over there, check out the uh, Smart Drive Test uh, TikTok channel there. And the other thing I'm going to try tomorrow, I'm not really broadcasting this, I'm going to try going live on TikTok and see how that goes for me. So if you're interested in the live stream on uh, TikTok, I'm going to do it uh, tomorrow morning, Tuesday at 11 a.m. So we're going to give that a go. Uh, Joe, wow, so much great, super helpful safety info this week. Uh, keep topping yourself. Rick, have a fabulous week. Uh, Corey, Tim, and everyone, thank you so much, Joe, uh, for that praise. That's awesome. Really makes me feel great. And uh, we keep keep trying, keep working to empowering drivers to be safer, smarter drivers. And we do appreciate uh, people here uh, participating in the community, asking questions, giving feedback. All of that helps us to be better and give you better information 
to get a driver's license, be a safer, smarter driver, or start a career as a truck or bus driver. Uh, CS, do you have a major city video on this? Uh, uh, was that the topic on left-hand turns? Uh, yeah, uh, Corey put the video up there on left-hand turns, so follow these steps to turn uh, left safely and pass your driver's test. Have a look at that for sure. Okay, we'll leave it there for this week. Thank you so much for all of your comments and feedback. You passed your driver's test in the last couple of weeks. Congratulations. You have a test coming up in the next couple of weeks. Good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer. Not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.